Hello and welcome to The Made Cast, the official podcast of the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment, a series of lectures on video game history as part of The Made's ongoing effort to preserve history through teaching and displaying playable exhibits of rare games and consoles. While life in the time of COVID has forced us to close our doors, the support of people like you has allowed us to continue to bring history to you through lectures like the one you'll hear in a few minutes. My name is Anthony. I'm Red. And I'm Miles. This week, Alex meets up with Matt Hargett, contributor on the FreeSci and Scum VM teams, to talk about his experience with adventure games in the late 80s and 90s and coding the adventure games and keeping this old genre alive. But first, let's talk about some news. So, it's January. It's early January. It's the new year. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Not a whole lot has happened since uh, since we last spoke, besides Cyberpunk, but we're going to not touch that iceberg. That's ongoing. Uh, we'll for a wait. later date. You know, <laughs> we might have to talk about that for its own thing. Yeah. There is some TV that is tangentially related. Uh, Witcher Season 2 is coming out sometime this year, probably March, April, May. Another fantasy and science fiction property that has... A game tie-in that's now getting TV shows is all the Bethesda properties. So Elder Scrolls has just gotten a uh, pretty severe rumor that Netflix is getting a TV show for them. Warms my heart. And Elder Scrolls is not traditional fantasy. Like when I think of fantasy, I think of, you know, wizards and hobbits and, you know, either Tolkien or uh, I don't know. Uh, The Witcher, right? The 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 Witcher, Witcher, you know, (laughs) traditional humans versus... Elves and dwarves versus monsters. Elder Scrolls is a bit more wild than that. It's crazy. And I'm really excited to see what they do with it because, one, I think it's going to be extremely hard to pull off. So I don't have incredibly high hopes, but I've been surprised before, even with The Witcher. Like, I didn't think The Witcher was going to work, and I enjoyed it immensely. Mm -hmm. So... Amazon already has announced that they are getting a uh, a Fallout TV show written by the Westworld writers. Lisa Joy and uh, Jonathan Nolan, they're going to be doing a Fallout TV show for Amazon, but Elder Scrolls is going on Netflix. Rumored. Mm-hmm. Rumored. So we will see what's going on. So that's, I don't know, that's going to be kind of a harder sell. I don't think the Fallout universe is as interesting to me. At the same time, it's going to be easier to write for because it's all people and ghouls, which are basically it's, just people in rubber fa- face masks. It's very, it's much more linear than anything of the Elder Scrolls world. Because mm-hmm. the, the Elder Scrolls games can span thousands of years of difference. <laughs> like, yeah. It, it'll be interesting. There's tons of lore involved, so it'll be really nice to be able to see how they take it because they can draw from numerous things but because there's so much it, it'll be interesting to see how they focus it mm-hmm. it's also i mean the fallout show is confirmed to be written by uh lisa joy and jonathan nolan the uh westworld people so they have a pretty good track record in my in my book i think that uh westworld is probably one of the best shows i've ever seen it's fantastic i have full faith in them they can do a great job with that so if, if anyone can do a Fallout show, it's those two. Agreed. Very agreed. Well said. As long as that, there hasn't been much other major news gaming-wise since we left off on the last episode. We will see what goes on in the future and what happens What happens this year with new game releases, new show releases. It'll be an interesting, it'll be an interesting time to see. Anyway, moving right along. Moving right along, now we're going to let Alex meet up with Matt Hargett, who was alive back in the early days. Matt is going to talk about uh, FreeSci, ScumVM, and sort of his efforts to keep sort of the adventure game, just entire genre alive, and sort of what that process is and how his experience has been. Anyway, here they are. All right. Welcome back, folks. This is uh, hopefully a much better 2021 than 2020, though we are very, very shortly into it. Uh, Today on the podcast, I would like to welcome a very good friend of mine for over two decades now, Matt Hargett. And I'm going to let Matt explain who exactly he is and why we brought him in here. Hello, this is the sound of my voice. I'm Matt Hargett. (laughs) I live in San Francisco with my husband of 20 years and our daughter. And uh, I've been working in technology 
for about a quarter century now. Uh, and yes, uh, I know Alex for 22 years or now or so. Yeah, it's been a long time. But uh, why why would I bring you on a show about adventure games, Matt? That's a... <laughs> Uh, because you ran out of people to ask? No, um, Absolutely not. No, you're very high on the list. <laughs> so uh, I grew up playing adventure games. I had involvement in a number of open source projects that, not just on the emulation side for games, but also specifically for adventure games. I had my hands in the code for Sarian, which uh, re-implemented the Sierra AGI engine that was used for kind of King's Quest 1 through 3 and Space Quest 1 and 2 and stuff like that. And uh, Free SCI which re-implemented the Sierra SCI interpreter, which was the successor to the AGI kind of engine that they had. And that's where you would play things like Colonel's Bequest or Leisure Suit Larry 2 and 3 or stuff like that. And then also Scum VM, which re-implemented LucasArts Scum engine script creation utility for Maniac Mansion, which was their own virtual machine uh, in kind of scripting language that was used for things like Maniac Mansion, of course, but also Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, Sam and Max Hit the Road. Certainly. The whole full throttle, probably. I think full throttle was still in scum. But anyways, on and on and on. Excellent. So I guess we should start off. One of the things in the previous episodes of Adventure Games uh, history that I have sort of, I've been very harsh on the Sierra games and how sort of brutal they were. Uh, Yeah, sure. But you obviously have an attachment to them. So in the time when you were originally playing them, what did you like about them? Uh, Well, it was made available to me. (laughs) And so, (laughs) you know, we so we got our PC in 1987. Before that, we had a TI 99. I think we got that in 1983 or so. And on the TI 99, we did not have the floppy drive attachment, and we used the cassette tape recorder to save our programs. But we didn't buy tapes and load stuff from tape. So we just used the cartridges for the TI 99. And there were some educational games for the TI-99 where you would type in words, but there were no text adventure games that I played on the TI-99. I'm sure someone will chime in in comments and say, that exists. And I don't doubt that it does, but that's not what we had access to. And also, I was born in 1978, so I was five and six on the TI-99. <laughs> and while I learned to type in basic programs from magazines into the TI-99, in terms of grammar and other stuff and reading reading ability, um, probably I wouldn't have been able to play adventure games super great up to that point. But 1987, we got our PC. And at some point that year or soon after, uh, played the first Sierra game. And that Amstrad PC we had in 1987 was CGA. So it was four colors. It was not EGA. And... The first real clear memory I have is Space Quest 1. And my mom pirated it from somebody at her work. (laughs) And it was a Christmas present. So that's the first one that I really remember. It might have been Christmas 1987 or kind of Christmas 1988 was the first exposure to to Sierra games. What stands out about Space Quest in your memory of it? I mean, I have distinct memories of the Space Quest series, but I'd like to hear yours. So my mom was a programmer and a gamer, and so she indoctrinated me into both pretty early. And probably with Space Quest, a big part of it was she loved, loved, loved Star Trek. Loved Star Trek. And so we would watch Star Trek, the original series, together. Actually, by that time, TNG was probably on the air, and we were watching it weekly uh, when it was on. So that probably is why it sticks out so much because it's kind of like a cross-media validation of this concept of living in space in a future, you know, whatever. And I haven't really thought about it before, but if I had to guess, that's probably why it's like really, why I can just talk about it, why it's within reach because it was such a fundamental thing to see that kind of story or universe concept like validated in that kind of cross-media sort of way. And as a child, I wasn't thinking about it that way, but that's probably the biggest thing. I mean, for me, the thing that stands out about Space Quest was the humor. That was what set it apart, I felt, from a lot of the other games. Certainly, I hadn't seen Leisure Suit Larry at that age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was probably nine when we were playing it. And so probably some of it was funny to me. But I probably, because you, you, it opens up and all the, red, all the red alarms are going off like you were in your janitor closet taking a nap i think <laughs> and then like and then like all of a sudden like you come out of blackness because all the red lights are going and so the i don't there might be an intro before that maybe you have played it more recently than me but i used to play it all the time when we were working on sarian to test because it's one of the shortest games you can play <laughs> from beginning to end 
but it's, uh, I can't, I don't have a super crisp memory of anything before the alarm's going off. But when it kicks off, it doesn't kick off in my recollection, you can correct me if I'm wrong, as a humor game. Like maybe no, in the right, text, right. there, there's a few little, not, it's not like Quest for Glory or Heroes Quest where it's like puns, 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 right? Which I, which I loved completely. And it was like the <laughs> exact right age when Quest for Glory or Heroes Quest came out to play it. But Space Quest starts off serious and it's the, the, the humor is kind of woven in whatever. But in those first moments, it's how the do I get off the ship? Right. And then it's only like because you're and you're looking for a key card, you go into the library and there's death, 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 death at every turn. The little the uh, people in the suits, the kind of their kind of stormtrooper equivalents come out and shoot you if you are in a place for too long, all that stuff. So my my recollection is that it doesn't reveal itself to be funny kind of until you're beyond those that immediate puzzle solving of I think you have to go into the this robot library and tell the robot to go to like G13 or something and pick out a thing and it gives you a code that you plug into something else and that gets you into the escape pod some something, something like sure, that sure. my recollection and again I don't have the savant memory to have the f- <laughs> all the dialogue memorized <laughs> is that up until that point it's pretty like you are going to die, get off the ship, not just because of the red sirens that it tells you, but also because there's the guards running around. There's, I think, a couple of ways for you to die pretty easily as well. Oh, yeah. Well, every CR game has lots of ways for you to die. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, and, and so I think that's where the humor, I think that might be where the first humor in Space Quest comes in, is where it's kind of teasing you, like, hey, maybe next time run faster or something like that. I think that's <laughs> probably the first indicator that you would run into in that game if you're playing it blind. And I'm sorry, that's a bad word to use now. Uh, if, if you're playing it fresh, like Blake. Sure, playing. sure. So not to rat hole too much on Space Quest specifically, but let's talk about when you first started using it to test the, oh, the, you know, the code you were contributing to, to FreeSCI and, and uh, ScumVM and Sarian. What, did, did you find anything while you were testing it that maybe you didn't know? Or what was this experience of sort of, instead of going back and playing a game that you loved, you were sort of dissecting a game that you loved? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So as a consumer of those games, no real concept that there was a common engine behind them or that someone had to think of that or why they had to think of that, right? There is a definite look and there other than Manhunter San Francisco and Manhunter um is it New York? Yeah, there there's two Manhunters. Yeah. They're all text parser based. Right. And then the SCI games later, it's like, okay, the graphics are slightly higher resolution. And now there's a overlay that comes up, right, when I'm typing stuff and uh, the font looks better and stuff like that. So as a consumer early on, even though at that time I was writing basic programs and a little bit of x86 assembly, and then, you know, I got into Pascal and then a C and whatever, I wasn't, I was making and trainers and for games like in debug.com which .com means something different from this era that doesn't have <laughs> but like in debug um you know looking for the woman in the red dress knopping out the bites so I like it wasn't decor in captain comic i think is the one uh, i had i learned assembly language to cheat on because it was so crazily brutal <laughs> um but i i wasn't i didn't have the the kind of metacognition or the architectural thing to like connect the dots or whatever so you know i was i grew up in illinois I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area in 1997. So, you know, Sarian and this stuff, I started to get into in like, once I wasn't homeless anymore. So like 1998, (laughs) 1999, something like that. And, you know, by that time, I had been working at McAfee. And one of the first products I worked on there had a Java-based user interface uh, for a management console for this thing that scanned, uh, was a virus scanning web proxy called WebShield for Firewall. And so I knew that Java was bytecode based. And that was familiar to me because in high school, the, my high school was didn't have the most money in the world, didn't have the most cutting edge equipment. So in high school in 1990 mumble, we were on Apple IIEs and programming UCSD Pascal from 1977 or 1978. <laughs> Hey, we had a Pascal program in my high school too. It was no slouch. It just was yeah. on newer computers. <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong, like uh, in, in 89 or 90, I was using Turbo Pascal on the PC. And that was awesome at the time. Like I was versus like typing like line by line assembly or line by line basic, having an editor and all that shit. And a debugger, oh my God, a debugger was like amazing. 
So when I had that Java experience in 90, 98 or so, and it was like, oh, it compiles to bytecode. I'm like, oh, this is just like the UCSD Pascal from high school. That's cool. But I don't think I had really heard of Smalltalk or any of the other bytecode-based languages at the time. And I still didn't have any idea that AGI and SCI were also a bytecode-based virtual machine. Didn't have that knowledge until I couldn't tell you. I, uh, probably slash dot, actually. How did I find out about Sarah and Free SCI? Probably slash dot. And joined the IRC channel. I think Free SCI came first. And then I was like, oh my God, people are re-implementing this engine. That's cool. And I don't know where DOSBox was at the time. Uh, it probably existed, but I don't know what its compatibility was like on Linux. Oh, it's come a non- very, very non- long way since that time. Oh, well, of course. It's it's like, even like, if you want to talk about 2003 onward, I can, <laughs> DOSBox is very viable for a lot of reasons, right? Uh, but back, but 1998, I don't know. I, I just, I don't have the knowledge to, to even tell you what, where it was or how it was doing. So I was like, this is amazing. And because I had this affinity and this affection for these for these games, not because I thought they were the best games, but they were just the games that were available to me growing up. We had a computer growing up, but we weren't like rich, 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 where we like bought every PC game that ever came out, whatever. Like if we bought a PC game like from the big box store, like um, CompUSA. No, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> I can't remember. It's, it's not coming to me immediately. It may come to me later. <laughs> Not KB Toys, but there's like something with a B in the name that I can't quite remember right Babbage's? now. Babbage's? Babbage's, thank you. Thank you. Babbage's at the mall or whatever. Like that wasn't a thing that I could do. So for a lot of these games, it was just like, you know, and I've heard other, I've heard game creators talk about this, like some of their favorite NES games are technically crappy games because when you're a poor kid and you can rent, you can't buy anything. You rent it for the weekend. That's the game. That's the game you are going to enjoy. Oh, absolutely. Come hell or high water, because that's just all that you can do. So I probably find out found out through free, about free SCI from Slashdot, and jumped in their IRC channel. And you know, I programmed from an early, from a young age, and did Basic and Quick Basic and Pascal and and uh, some assembly language and a little bit of C. But when I was sometime around, I don't know, sixteen, seventeen, I just. I got to the point where I found programming to be really tedious. It like wasn't like an exciting adventure anymore. And, uh, kind of no pun intended. Like it was kind of like okay, I can type in this program again, or okay, I can optimize this graphics drawing routine and assembly to get rid of the snow at the bottom of the screen. And I just kind of lost the, the the wind at my back for some reason. So when I so for free CI, you know, I was still involved in open source, still involved in security and hacking, reverse engineering stuff. But like programming itself was a chore to me. It wasn't something I enjoyed doing in my free time. I still love playing games in my free time, but not programming. Free SCI and the folks who were on that project at that time, Christoph Reichenbach, Solomon Peachy, Lars Scovland, maybe there's one or two other people I'm not quite remembering right now. They were so nice and so encouraged. I just joined their IRC channel on, I think it was, maybe, I don't know if Freenode existed at the time, maybe it did. But anyway, I joined the RIC channel and they were so nice and so encouraging where I was like, hey, I found this bug. And they just basically took the time to kind of gently encourage me to go debug it myself. And so, you know, I got, uh, and I was on Windows and none of them had enthusiasm for Windows. So I was like, <laughs> okay, I can do, I, I got Windows machine and Visual C++. So, so I became like kind of the Windows port maintainer for them. Uh, again, just because they were so kind and patient and like, hey, I hit this problem. How do I fix this, right? Because um, I hadn't done C or C++ programming at scale. So even just reading the chicken bones of error messages from the compiler or linker was like a whole education for me. And FreeSCI was really the boost into the next phase of my career. Mm. I had a good understanding of operating system fundamentals, a reasonable, I'm going to say good, a reasonable Better understanding where I, could, I, where I could, <laughs> could kind of connect dots. But that free SCI experience of getting that to build, fixing those bugs, making that better, and their patience. And also, Christoph Reichenbach was in academia for a long time. So, and he was a TA and a professor and whatever else. So he like had the mindset of how to like, you know, kind of guide me through the maze of, the, of this stuff. I really give free SCI that credit, not just Christoph, but Lars and the other people as well, just for their attitude and stuff like that. And that's, that's something I very much try to keep in mind when at companies where like I'm having to work with interns and stuff like that is 
not just giving them the answers or making sure they can be independent, but also be successful and not get so stuck or stymied that they like lose the enthusiasm. So that's probably the entry point is free SCI. And once I kind of had my C legs in terms of compiling C and C++, single stepping through in the debugger, which I did with Turbo Debugger, which wrote Pascal and, and assembly stuff as well. But it really, after kind of not honing my programming skills for a good seven or eight years, it really got me back into it because it was this relatable thread of Seer adventure games. I could like, th- that was the string on the kite I could yeah. grab onto and sure. it could whisk, kind of whisk me away into the, that next level of my career, which was, you know, not just more programming, but thinking more architecturally and about program structure and stuff like that. Uh, so we only have like one minute left. <laughs> I know we went on, we went on and on, but that's, all, that's fine. That's exactly what this podcast is about. And I think I, we will have you back when we get Chip Morningstar on here. So you can ask all of your intense questions about uh, Scum VM and so forth. But uh, if we can close it out here, I'm sure there are people listening to this wondering, you know, saying to themselves, oh, well, that was 2003. I can't do that anymore. I've missed my chance. Do you have any kind words or any projects to suggest they maybe reach out to yeah. help them? Yeah, so FreeSCI and Sarian um, got folded into Scum VM at some point. FreeSCI was a clean room reverse engineering. It wasn't, re- it wasn't directly reverse engineering and translating the assembly language into C++ like Scum VM did. Eventually, it's enough people peel off free SCI that just got folded into Scum VM. Scum VM, I think, is still a really great C++ project to come to speed on. Uh, I'm not deeply familiar with the active developers now, but um, that's another one where there's a lot of nice people there. It's kind of a well-structured, uh, or less, less my, la- my last checkpoint, a well-structured C++ code base that is very cross-platform. If you want to get into development, you want to get into development using the hacked tool chains, stuff like that. Scum VM is a great project to get into it on because it is very cross-platform across all these different consoles. The C++ is, um, is, should be very approachable. And the people there who I believe are still active, that same kind of kindness and patience and stuff is all kind of there for you. So whether you're a fan of Sierra games, older or earlier, or you're a fan of Scum, or you're a friend of, uh, friend of a fan of Legend of Corandia, or any of the of those Westwood titles or whatever, you can kind of get that, grab onto that same string on a kite in Scum VM and try to not recreate, but go on that same kind of journey and just going like one level deeper into programming in a way that is kind of fun and will make you appreciate those game engines and those games on a deeper level than maybe that you have before. And indeed, they're still adding games to that system. I mean, they've got New World Computing Absolutely. games. They've got the, you know, Lands of Lore and Mist. Uh, but thank you so much for being here, Matt. It's been great to see you. Awesome. Always good to talk to you, Alex. All right. Thank you, Alex and Matt, for that wonderful talk about preserving, like, you know, all these great adventure games. Uh, a lot of things that are at risk of uh, getting lost into the ether unless... Uh, People like Matt and others are preserving them and making sure that they are held on to for future generations. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Matt. There's actually even still a um, small but community of people who, um, you know, build adventure games like like ScumVM and um, FreeSci are basically for replaying old adventure games mm-hmm. but um there are there are still people out there and there are still like um you know adventure games being made like yeah uh, and uh, though like like uh, all these old adventure games are they're so unique i mean just like for example uh like the king's quest mm-hmm. games uh, th- those type of like unique kind of like text story games are not text, but you know, like search um, or like open container, like command mm-hmm. games. They're, they're amazing stories, and they're fantastic. Um, so good on you guys. Um, if you want to support, go to the scum. Uh, if you want to support and check it out, you can go to scumvm.org. That's s c u m m v m dot org. I highly recommend you check them out and give it a shot. So, in other news. Not many games have been, well, I mean, other than the big one, uh, Miles and 
Anthony have some great games to share with us. I know Miles has been playing Ghost of Tsushima. I mean, Anthony, sorry, has been playing Ghost of Tsushima. And how has that been? Oh, it's been it's been fantastic. I jumped right into the multiplayer mode. I kind of just played only 30 minutes of this story. Okay. So all my friends are <laughs> sort of playing that, so I'm mm-hmm. playing online with them. Uh, it, it's great. It's um, The multiplayer mode sort of touches on the supernatural side of Japanese mythology, which Ooh. really isn't in, in the... In the, in the base game so it has really? this, this uh very spooky kind of uh feel to it which uh i, I really like and awesome. pretty much the gameplay is you, you can choose between four classes healer hunter samurai or assassin and pretty much you're just tackling these sort of um new story quests leveling up powering up getting new gear loot uh costumes emotes as well as uh sort of survival modes where you just face off against hordes of enemy types and um currently right now i'm just trying to grind up to where i can tackle the raids okay is it um the question i have about it is it as cinematic in the multiplayer as it is in the main story i've only played about 30 minutes of the story modes uh, based off of what I've seen. Uh, not so much. Okay. More, it's sort of more I mean, it would kind of be fitting. Based. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my understanding of Ghost of Tsushima is that the single player is kind of based on um, like the, the samurai movie, like uh, Kira Kurosawa, like, you know, Yojimbo or Seven mm-hmm. Samurai or those mm-hmm. kinds of films. And those are extremely cinematic, like, you know, Kurosawa was a genius at making things look amazing. And and from from just hearing you talk about it, it sounds like the like multiplayer is a completely different game basically. Like does it play differently or is it still sort of the same mechanics but Yeah, there's um the combat is the same as far as um, you know, attacking and parrying and dodging, but you are limited in, t- in the amount of stances you can use. Uh, I think in the base game, you can use all, eventually get up to all four stances, which is effective against sort of each enemy type. But in in this uh, mode, you're only allowed about two stances. So you have to sort of strategize as to what stance you want to uh, sort of uh, specialize in. So do you still have access to all four, but you have to only pick two? In the beginning, you're allowed only one class. And as you rank up, okay. level up, you'll eventually unlock all the other classes. And so okay. each class has their own sort of special trait and things they can do. Nice. It's another one on the list, the never-ending endless list of games I could do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's you know, so if anyone wants to pay me to play it, <laughs> it I'll be it, glad it's, to. It's really <laughs> fun if you have like sort of a group of people to play with. It's it's really I'm not awesome. generally tempted by consoles, but the PlayStation 4 in particular really tempted me this generation because of all of its like just stellar exclusives, like Spider-Man, uh God of War, and then right at the end of the generation goes to Tsushima. I was just so close to buying a PS4 and playing all those. But now you just but, get a PS5 and then you can buy those games on the PS5. Is that, is that... Uh, can I get a PS5 though? Yes, you should get a PS5. Everybody get a PS5. D- well, don't like uh, get it eventually. Don't get it now. Wait till the slim comes out. I mean, you can't get it now. No, but get the slim when the PS5 slim comes yeah. out because that's an inev- inevitability. Yeah. There will always be a slimmer version of a next gen console. <laughs> I mean, one of the one of the nice things about being a PC gamer is that things eventually come to you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like I was, I was interested in playing uh, Horizon Zero Dawn oh. like years ago when it first came out on, I think PS4. Yes. <laughs> and, and I was like, wow, that's a really cool exclusive. I want to play that too bad. It's only on PlayStation. So I passed on it and now it's out on PC and it's great. So I'm holding out hopes that, you know, eventually uh, Bloodborne comes to PC. Eventually God of War comes to PC. Mm. If it doesn't, then, you know, maybe a generation down the line, I'll go back and pick it up for like 200 bucks, 300 bucks. Mm-hmm. With all those games. <laughs> like, is exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I do. It'll be a deal. Yes. It's great. I, I do have to say, I haven't played Horizon Zero Dawn, but that is another one on the like the that is pretty much the top game on the list of the things that I've been wanting mm-hmm. to play that I haven't played yet. Yeah. God of War was an amazing game. Could not recommend yeah. that enough. It, one of the best, one of the best exclusives I've just seen in general. Uh, n- not even console related, just exclusive. It's it's an amazing advancement and character development of someone who is very one dimensional for three games. <laughs> mm-hmm. I angry. I kill everyone. 
Oh, you Big God make shift. me angry. I kill you. Oh, Titan make me angry. I kill it too. Is <laughs> right. But that's I mean, but that's God of War. And now he, now he's just like, oh, I have son. I get old. I go fight different gods. <laughs> is it, is I'm sad. <laughs> I go find new gods. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you got it. The storytelling in it was pretty phenomenal. Uh, some of the best uh, game story I've heard. And just the, it, very touching. Very touching. Even the overuse of the word boy was pretty funny and heartwarming boy. after a while. Boy. Boy. Come here, boy. <laughs> what are you doing, boy? Do you scratch your knee? Boy, <laughs> did you kill a god? Boy, all right. <laughs> anyway, you can't say son once. All right, <laughs> can't acknowledge your your child. All right, but as far as that, I don't think there's much else news going on at the moment. Um, I think that's pretty much it for the day. That's all I've got time for. But in the future. We'll see what happens. We'll see you next week, at least in the meantime. So until then, stay frosty. Happy New Year. And we'll see you next week on the Maidcast. Yeah, thanks for listening. If you've got any thoughts, questions, corrections, or general museum ideas, shoot us an email at info at themaid.org. We'd like to send a big thank you to everyone who donated recently and to our Patreon supporters who keep the maid afloat. Patreon donors get to listen to this podcast one week before it's released on major streaming services. And we'll continue that with future episodes every week. Every week. Every week. It's going to be a full year, everybody. Till then. Till then, I'm Alex. Red. I'm Miles. I'm Anthony. And we'll see you next time.